as I keep saying, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm alive now. I, I don't want to see this horror. I mean, you spoke before about how quickly a, maybe an, um, an afterlife could just appear uh, out of developments in quantum technology. I mean, the amount of iterations of evolution, evolutionary computing you could run is extraordinary compared to any that we've done before. You might even be able to get as many processing clock cycles with the appropriate quantum computing that there ever has been in all the quantum, in all the classical computers in, in the world that have ever existed in one second. Maybe, maybe. Not even a second. I mean, like talking with the numbers before. I mean, if, if, you, if you think about it. It's like you, you could turn, like, you could simulate evolution or at least like um, the evolution of a Possibly, possibly. But if if you think, I mean, real evolution that's taken us, well, it's taken billions of years. This is blind evolution. Yeah, but but what is it? It's it's nanotech, right? So therefore, it's quantum because you know that scale, everything's quantum. Blind, and it's taken billions of years with zillions of experiments and you know, molecules everywhere. Right? And it's taken a huge amount of time to search through that, that evolutionary space to lead to us. And, then, and we're just one species. So it looks as though it's extremely large search space and very, very difficult to, to, to get something like us. So my gut feeling is just doing it blindly is extremely improbable. So we'd be directing the evolution. Yeah, yeah, and 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 using ourselves as a model. We've just, been able just, to direct the evolution. I mean, we've we've created um, we've created things which are far superior to us in, in some ways. In some ways so. Yeah, yeah, but not not in terms of intelligence because we don't know what intelligence is yet. But but I but I see this link. We might look back one day and say, oh, that really is a form of intelligence. Just because mm -hmm. we don't know what it is doesn't mean. With oh yeah, computing. yeah, may, maybe, you maybe. Don't need to know yeah, what yeah. You can still, you can still build it without understanding it. Mm. Yeah, agreed. Mm. We have it. But but the odds of getting there blindly are just. Though we we may not understand how um, intelligence is completely now, but we have yeah. some pretty good ideas. Yeah, well, of course. Really yeah, well, because well, I don't. It's, and that's because we, we know more and more. We're getting more and more ideas from neuroscience and insights and. You know, whole, whole parts of the brain now are becoming simulable. And we know a hell of a lot about how vision works right, in the brain, stuff like this. We know a lot about the anatomy of the, the various parts, you know, the modules of the brain, and how they connect up. We don't, we don't know the full dynamics yet, but there's so much progress on, in neuroscience. I suspect you know, before the end of this century, we, we will have almost, almost one to one uh, mappings of human brains in, in our machines. We, that they will be genuinely electronic brains, right? S simulated almost almost to the level of detail of each synapse in a real brain. See that coming, and more because the potential of electronics is so much greater. So what level of simulation do you think we need in order to recreate a functionally um, operable brain? That's a really good question. Like if you ask that of Ben Goetzel, he, he argues, he, he says you don't need neuroscience. Well, maybe he's softened a bit since then, I'm not sure, but, but he's, you know, a couple of years ago he was saying quite strongly that um, you probably don't need that level of detail. It's just the more macro type connectivities and that, that, that you need, but you need to know which ones. I still don't know which ones, but so, so he's dreaming up ideas on how to create intellig artificial intelligences that are generally intelligent. Like, maybe I can go into the difference between AI and AGI now. So um, artificial intelligence as a term, I think was coined in the mid 50s and the very first AI artificial intelligence conference was held in 56 in America. Right? So 
So AI is now well, over, over half a century old. And we still don't have AI. Yeah. It, it, we, still, we still don't have intelligent machines. So, it's 50 years. Yeah, well, okay. So for, for a decade or two, the big dream was to create intelligent machines. And then after a while, people just gave up. It was just, it was just too difficult. They just gave up. And then AI split into a lot of little specialties, specialities like, like vision, machine learning, uh, database, uh, that kind of, kind of stuff. But recently, thanks largely to Moore's Law, uh, there's been a, a swing back to the old dream of, of general artificial intelligence, not, not specialized intelligence. Like today's Google, for example, an extremely useful, practical example of AI, but it's a very specialized algorithm. Right? It's, it's very narrow. Like um, if, you, if you type in, uh, uh, in Google, you know, if you type in the question like, um, what is the average weight of a two-year-old pig? And you'll probably get something, but by uh, syntactic search, you'll probably get some kind of answer. Uh, but if you if you type in something like um, uh, you know, when when is when is the birth when is the birth date? Of a dead pig or something. Or when, when, when did Eisenhower um, die? Or, you know, how old was um, Einstein when he discovered relativity? <laughs> but you can you can type in questions that make no sense, mm -hmm. right? Oh, okay. Sorry. But Google can't handle it because mm -hmm. it's still syntactic. It's not it's not it's not using syntax. Uh, it's using syntax. It, it's not using semantics, which is the study of meaning. Because it's not smart enough. So, it's, what, so is that natural language processing when it's just studying syntax but not meaning? Well, NLP tries to to, you know, to do semantics, but it's very difficult. What? Like you know, time, what time, time, time flies like an arrow. Or <clears throat> like there's a famous example in the fifties when Americans were trying to catch up with the Russians you know, with a Sputnik scare. So there's a lot of translation going automate translation using computers. So somebody typed in in English uh, a famous phrase, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Like old men sexually attracted but can't do anything too old. Right? The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. It goes, gets translated into Russian and then gets translated back from the, from the Russian translation back into English. And then you look at the English and it came out of something like uh, uh, the beer is flat and the meat is rotten, or <laughs> something like this. Right? So, so there's, there's a long way to go. Okay, so, <clears throat> but but now, thanks largely to Moore's law, there's there's now a growing awareness amongst AI researchers, and motivating them to return to the old dream, the dream of the 50s and 60s, to get back to general artificial intelligence or, or AGI. And that's Ben Goetzel's one of the like the pioneers, pretty well the father of this. I mean it's his term, AGI. So uh, and and because of Moore's law, uh, neuroscience is also blossoming. In fact, Ben Ben and I, just just, just now effectively, we've we've come out with the planet's first special issue in a journal on the theme of artificial brains. Right. So we, we hope that will launch the field, make it much more popular with other people. And, and so artificial brain technology uh, just blossoms. I mean, Moore's law has enabled it. And it, you got, you're getting this marriage now between uh, modern electronics due, due to Moore's law and neuroscience. And their, their influence, well, Modern electronics is influencing neuroscience profoundly because it's creating all these powerful new tools, you know, more powerful computers. They can simulate uh, at, at a high level of detail um, neural circuits 
and, and whole components of brains. And, you know, and as, as Moore's law goes up, 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 then the artificial brains will be more and more brain-like. So you know, that, that's, that's coming. And once the artificial brains get smart enough, then, then we get AGI. Right? Now, Ben will argue, well, the last time I talked to him about this, that uh, you don't really need all that detailed neurocircuitry knowledge. All, all you really need is more the, the connections between the major components at, at a higher, higher level of uh, abstraction but far less detail. In other words, you need far fewer bits to simulate it. So long as you've got, so long as you've got the connections between the components and, and the function of what each component is supposed to do. And that's still a big question mark. You still, still don't really know what's going on. But, but he thinks that uh, once that knowledge is there, you can probably put it into a much smaller device you know, with far fewer bits, and it's still smart. Because, because you got to the essence of what intelligence is. Hmm. Now, he doesn't know what it is, but he, he speculates, and he's got a book coming out very soon Something called Building Better Minds. So I'm looking, looking forward to reading it. And soon, just a few months away. So, uh, yeah, so all, all this push from the brain builders, the, the ABs, uh, or the VAs, the brain architects, that, that's coming. So, so in a sense you could say, well, I'm, I'm retired now, I'm, I'm now looking to Fermi Tech, but uh, people like me, we are the source of the problem. Right? If you make an analogy, go back to the, I don't know, middle, middle 30s, 1930s, and you're talking about a handful of nuclear physicists saying that the bomb, the bomb, is coming, right? Because they, they knew about the idea of uh, splitting, splitting the atom, more or less. Well, let's say, well, I mean, Zillard, he, he's one of my heroes, Leo, Leo Zillard. He, he speculated that, that the atom, you know, the nucleus, could be split and, and out would shoot a lot of neutrons. And those neutrons, because they're neutral, they're neutrally charged, they're not charged. Right? So instead of being deflected by the nucleus, which is positively charged, you know, the nucleus is neutrons plus protons. Neutrons have no charge, but the protons have a charge. So if you shoot a proton at a nucleus, the positive charge and the positive charge will repel each other. So you get, you get this kind of, but a neutron doesn't feel that force because it's, you know, it's, it has no charge. So it just goes straight in. So it's a wonderful nuclear bullet. Right? It doesn't get deflected by, by, by repulsive uh, electric forces. It just, it just, if, you know, if it's on target, it just goes straight in. So uh, Zillard's speculating that, wow, you can split the atom, then out come a lot more neutrons. And he's the first guy to measure just how many would come out. And if enough come out, then you can get a chain reaction because those that do come out split other nuclei, which in turn send out more neutrons to split more nuclei, until you get like you know, several kilograms of, of uranium fissioning. You know, fission means to split into, into parts. Right? 